Welcome to Mexico Unexplained, where we will explore the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. This series presents information based partly on theory and conjecture. The podcaster's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones to the subjects we will examine. Here is your host, Robert Bito. Welcome, and muy bienvenidos to episode number 280 of Mexico Unexplained, where we examine the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. I'm your host, Robert Pitto. In the United States in the 1800s, there was great interest in the mysterious civilizations of ancient Mexico. As the science of archaeology had not yet been born, various theories circulated about the many ruined cities and how their builders were related to other ancient cultures throughout the world. Because there was no hard science behind most any of this, amateur academics, treasure hunters, adventurers, and even religious figures at the time had a whole host of explanations for these lost cities and vanished civilizations of Mexico. One of the big figures studying and exploring the Maya region in the latter half of the 1800s was the French-American Augustus Le Plongeon. He and his wife Alice Dixon Le Plongeon used a new technique called psychic archaeology to sense where things were buried and then put everything together in a story using a type of intuitive channeling of events from the past. For a more detailed description of the adventures of the Le Plongeons in the Yucatan, please see Mexico Unexplained episode number 110, called The Lost Continent of Mu and the Mexican Mother Civilization. A big turning point in the research of the Le Plongeons occurred when Augustus found, by psychic means of course, a large reclining stone figure seven meters underground, which he called a chalk mole, a name meaning red or great jaguar paw, in Yucatec Maya. He immediately declared that Chalk Mole had been a ruler of Chichen Itza, and he had seen this ruler depicted throughout the ruins on stone carvings and in murals. Le Plongeon tried to spirit the statue out of Mexico to get it to the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in the United States but was thwarted by government officials who apprehended the chalk mole and took it to Mexico City. There, it was exhibited as one of the most important finds of the century and part of the Mexican patrimony that would never leave the country. Since the initial discovery of this sculpture, there have been many more similar reclining statues unearthed in Mexico and Central America. Le Plongeon's name for this carved stone figure stuck, and these sculptures are collectively known today as chalk moles. So what exactly does a chalk mole look like? Mary Ellen Miller of Yale University published a good description in her article titled A Re-Examination of the Mesoamerican Chalk Mole in the March 1985 edition of the Art Bulletin. Miller states, quote, the distinctive posture of the chalk mole is what allows the many sculptures to be united under one term, regardless of their origin. In all cases, the figure reclines on his back, his knees bent, and his body on a single axis from neck to toes. The elbows rest on the ground and support the torso, creating tension as the figure strains to sit upright. The hands meet at the chest, usually holding either a disc or a vessel. The head rotates 90 degrees from the axis of the body to present a frontal face. The recumbent position represents the antithesis of aggression. It is helpless and almost defenseless, humble and acquiescent. End quote. Since the first discovery of a chalk mold by Le Plongeon in 1875, there have been at least 30 of these figures found from the western Mexican state of Michoacan all the way down through Central America. All chalk moles fit the general style that Mary Ellen Miller wrote about, but each sculpture is different, as if exhibiting its own distinct personality. All date to what archaeologists and other researchers refer to as the Terminal Classic period, beginning at around 800 A.D. Consequently, no such reclining sculptures have ever been found at the central Mexican powerhouse of Teotihuacan or at any of the Maya sites during the height of classic Maya civilization. 
By default, they were unknown to the much earlier Olmec civilization, considered to be by some as the mother civilization of ancient Mesoamerica. Some archaeologists believe that the Chakmol imagery began sometime with the classic Maya, but this is open to a lot of speculation and interpretation. Chakmols have been found at the Toltec capital of Tula, which leads some to believe that the whole concept of the Chakmol began with the Toltec civilization. Fourteen Chakmols have so far been discovered at the Maya site of Chichen Itza and date to the post-classic phase of that city, at which time most researchers believe the city had either direct Toltec influence or experienced a sort of cultural diffusion from the Toltec region of central Mexico. Chakmols have popped up here and there throughout Mesoamerica. One was found in Veracruz, at the archaeological site of Sempoala, for example, and another one was found at a remote site in Michoacan. The farthest south a Chakmol was ever found was at the site of Las Mercedes in Costa Rica. In 1943, the first Aztec Chakmol was discovered in the heart of Mexico City, near the modern-day intersection of Benustiano Carranza and Pino Suarez. The second Aztec Chacmol was discovered with the unearthing of the Templo Mayor complex in Mexico City in the 1960s. This sculpture is showing his teeth in a non-threatening way and is painted various colors, mostly blues and reds, with a golden medallion painted on his chest. The Templo Mayor Chacmol is the only one painted that is known to exist. Some chalk moles may exist in private collections outside of Mexico. Many chalk moles found in museums cannot be adequately traced back to a specific ancient city, as some were illegally taken or have come off private land holdings. Although there are some 30 to 50 chalk moles thought to exist, researchers still debate their meaning although some solid interpretations are now gaining wider acceptance among Mesoamerican archaeologists. The first interpretation came from the one who gave the sculpture its name, the first discoverer of this genre, the French-American antiquarian and adventurer Augustus Le Plongeon. Le Plongeon stated, quote, It is not an idol, but a true portrait of a man who has lived an earthly life. I have seen him represented in battle, in councils, and in court receptions. End quote. His interpretation was based on channeling the spirits of the ancient Maya as part of his method of psychic archaeology, used in Chichen Itza and other places. To Le Plongeon, not only was the sculpture of a real person, but this mythical ruler Chakmol was also known as Prince Ko. Chakmol was the brother of Prince Ak the evil lord of Ushmal. Prince Ak defeated Chakmol in mortal combat, and Chakmol's widow came to rule the kingdom as Queen Mu. The territory of Chichen Itza and its surroundings became known as the Kingdom of Mu. Queen Mu was then forced to marry her evil brother-in-law, Prince Ak, at which point she fled to Egypt, where she was revered as the goddess Isis. While the Le Plongeon inventive interpretation of the Chakmol may have been gripping to read about in the late 1800s, serious scholarly attention given to these statues did not begin until the latter half of the 20th century. Researchers who began studying Chakmols put forth the idea that the sculpture's functions varied on culture, geography, and the time period during which they were fashioned. There is great consensus among archaeologists that chalk moles were not worshipped as they were not found in the inner sanctums of temples or other holy places. Researchers now believe that chalk moles may have served three different functions. The first theory is that the chalk mole was a simple offering table and received gifts from the devout seeking supernatural assistance. The offerings could have been food, alcoholic beverages, tobacco, feathers, cacao beans, or incense. The chacmol found in Costa Rica is holding a form of metate, or corn grinding stone, in its hands, which is resting on his belly in typical fashion. This would seem to be a receptacle for offerings of food. In Nahuatl, 
the Aztecs called a small table for offerings of Tlamanalco. In some cases, the Chacmol could have functioned as a sort of public Tlamanalco. The second and third interpretations of the function of the Chacmols have to do with human sacrifice. This is a much maligned topic, especially among certain revisionists or those who wish to have a more romantic view of the Aztecs and their empire. A Chacmol from Tlaxcala has a carving of a bloodied heart on its underside, which has led some researchers to believe that a Chacmol served as an offering table for what the Nahua-speaking peoples called a Kwaushikali. A Kwaushikali was a receptacle to receive blood and hearts in human sacrifice. The scholars who back the second interpretation believe that after a victim was sacrificed, an offering was made in the removable Kwaushikali and placed on the center of the Chakmol, on that flat surface or slightly indented area on the figure's belly. The last most widely discussed theory on the purpose of the Chakmol has the sculpture as serving as an actual sacrificial table called a Techkat in the Nahuatl language. Victims were stretched across the middle of the Chakmol and their hearts were extracted. The main source for this theory comes from a manuscript called the Cronica Mexicoyot, written by an Aztec source a few decades after the conquest. In this Cronica, the author describes war captives being sacrificed on a large stone that was sculpted in partially human form with a twisted head. This is the only surviving colonial account of a possible use of a chacmol, and the document itself has been called into question, with various scholars arguing over authorship or whether it is even an authentic chronicle written by an indigenous scholar in the 1500s. The association with the god Tlaloc at the Templo Mayor in the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan is used by the human sacrifice theorists to further the theory of chalk moles used as tables for human sacrifice. Some of the water imagery carved on many chalk moles make the sculpture appear as if it is floating on water. This water imagery may symbolize a state in between the earthly and the supernatural realms, suggesting the chalk moles may have been messengers to or intermediaries with the gods. The author and Yale professor Mary Ellen Miller, previously mentioned, also tends to believe that the chalk mole was connected with human sacrifice, either as a table for the offering bowls of hearts and blood, or as a place where sacrifices actually took place. She notes that the reclining, defenseless position of the chalk mole, with its bent elbows and knees, is the position of many depictions of captives in ancient Mesoamerican art. The only thing that these researchers are missing, it seems, is the logistical problems the chalk mole faces if it is used as a sacrificial table. Most chalk moles have too small a middle surface area to serve this function. It would be nearly impossible to drape a victim over one of the sculptures to sacrifice that unlucky person to the gods. Yet, this theory persists. As with many artifacts from ancient Mexico, the chalk mole is still somewhat mysterious and open to a wide range of interpretations by archaeologists and other researchers. As more is discovered, more will be learned, and perhaps one day we will know the real purpose of this very enigmatic sculpture. Thank you once again for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained. Remember to like and subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on Twitter. Tell your friends by sharing these shows with others. Please go to our website, MexicoUnexplained.com, for references, illustrations, and for free access to transcripts of past shows. Please visit Amazon.com to purchase the books, Mexico Unexplained and Mexican Monsters, to get hard copies of the magic, the mysteries, and the miracles of Mexico. We appreciate your kind attention once again. Until next time, thank you and gracias. Thank you for listening to another episode of Mexico Unexplained with host Robert Bitto. For show summary, relevant links and commentary, please check out our website at MexicoUnexplained.com. Like us on Facebook and be a part of the conversation. Adios and hasta la vista.